Hi, let's get this session started. It's my great pleasure to introduce Emily uh, Bradlau, speaking on behalf of PTC Therapeutics, and we are looking forward uh, for her starting the session on the scientific updates. And uh, welcome, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here today. It's a packed house, which I'm thrilled to see you all. Um, we're going to talk today about RNA splicing platforms, everything you ever wanted to know, or many things you wanted to know, some of the things you wanted to know. We'll figure that out. Um, I'm pleased to be speaking today on behalf of PTC Therapeutics, which is a global company um, with more than 1,300 employees. We're going to start with a little video just to kind of put us all on the same page. So the splicing platform is based on what we call uh, splicing, which is a natural process. It's a very complex process, but if I want I did that, I'm sorry. to like explain to a general audience, I can use an analogy of making a cupcake. So you can think the DNA as a recipe book, which contains a lot of different recipes. Now, when it comes to RNA, will be one particular recipe out of that book. So let's say that you have a cupcake recipe. So your cupcake recipe will be your RNA and your cupcake will be your protein. Now the splicing is the process where you take that message and process differently and you come up with the different recipes. So for an example, if I take the same analogy, let's say that you have a uh, message, say make blueberry cupcake. Um, so that will be your RNA. Now if you can process this RNA and you make a blueberry cupcake, that's one protein. Now, you can take the same RNA and process alternatively and take out certain words and you can make, instead of make blueberry cupcake, you say make blue cupcake. So take out the berry word. Now you have a different product. Now let's say you take out the word cup. Now you make blueberry cake. So you can see that the same message can be processed in different ways to produce different products. So that's the process we call the splicing. So it's a very complex biological process. What we do as scientists, we try to understand this complex natural process and we translate it to a something that is useful for us. In this case, we're trying to make a drug out of it. We're trying to use that knowledge to develop drugs. So that's what our splicing platform is. There we go. We're going to talk first a little bit about anatomy, just to kind of give you a sense of where all of this is happening. We'll talk about how cells work because splicing happens inside of cells. We'll talk about how proteins are made. That's the magic of splicing and some details about splicing. And then we're going to wrap up with talking about how this affects your genes, genetics. So we are all organisms. We're made up of multiple organ systems, like your heart, your lungs, your stomach. Um, well, those are organs. Your organ system, your digestive system is your mouth, your intestines, your stomach, and etc. Those are made up of tissues. Tissues are made up of a bunch of cells working together in collaboration. And molecules and atoms make up those cells. So when we're talking about the size of these things and what we're thinking of, a cell, I want you to think of a city. Glasgow is a cell, OK? Proteins maybe are cars within Glasgow. They're much smaller than that whole cell. Small molecules like splicing modifiers are maybe like a piece of paper that could fit into a car, right? That fit wildly. Many, many, many of these could be in a city. So small molecules, you're exposed to these all the time. Every time you take a medicine by mouth, that's a small molecule. The molecules are small enough to sneak through the cells in your intestines to get into your blood. Bigger medicines like proteins and even bigger than those, they need to be injected into your body somehow with a needle because they're too big to trick your stomach and intestines into letting them in, okay? So there are a lot of cells here. I want to see, can you, if I move my mouse, you can see that, okay. So we have a number of cells here. These are just from a plate in a lab, okay? The blue cell center here is a nucleus. It's basically the brain of the cell, that's where your DNA live. Your DNA are replicated inside the nucleus. Here, the green this is what we call the scaffolding of the cell. It's what gives it its shape. You see this guy over here has got this long arm. Those green proteins there, sometimes Huntington protein acts like a scaffolding protein and can help a cell to have its shape, okay? 
Now on the outside, you have the membrane of the cell, and that's what holds everything in the city inside, your border of the city, right? But things are allowed to come in and out, and you see that happening here. These two cells have some kind of communication happening. Maybe there's a protein going in and out between those cells. Huntington protein also helps to regulate what goes in and out of cells. So this is a very important protein that is in all of our cells in all of our body. What we were talking about in the video was specifically about splicing. Now DNA, this is your genes, okay? Those, what you're born from, and they define exactly what color hair you have, what color eyes you have, how tall you are, among other things. That is then transcribed into RNA. RNA is then spliced to make different kinds of proteins, okay? So what we're talking about today is mostly the bottom half of this slide. Now proteins, sounds a little abstract, although we all know we eat protein every day, right? But it's still a little bit of an abstract concept. So I wanted to talk to you about proteins you might have heard of. So collagen is a protein that gives firmness and structure. Lipase helps you to digest your cheeseburger in the afternoon. Elastin helps your skin stay smooth and elastic, okay? Fibrin clots your blood. Antibodies, in the last three years, we've heard a lot about antibodies. They help to fight infections. Insulin is a protein that regulates how much sugar stays in your blood. That's very important. Um, and then adrenaline, we all know a good adrenaline rush when, I don't know, when you're exercising or frightened or stressed or nervous about giving a talk. It helps your body to respond and control stress. And that's really just a protein that's excreted into your blood and it moves all throughout your body and it changes how you interact with the world, right? Your palms might get a little sweaty, your heart might race. That's just one protein doing something reliably in your body. Now when we're talking about genes, the DNA, that recipe book mentioned in the video, it's pretty complicated, right? There's a lot of information in there. Not all of it is used to make a protein. The parts that are not used are called introns, and they're all over the place. Now the DNA is transcribed as exactly as is possible into RNA. So RNA is very, very like your DNA. When we want to, it's, this is true for humans and for other organisms, even as down to yeast. But you see, ours are pretty complicated. There's a lot of in and out, a lot of introns and extrons in there. So we take all these introns out to make one continuous blueprint or recipe, right? And that is what is made into a protein. Because we have a lot of proteins that we need, you can think of maybe how many cars there are in Glasgow. Um, there are so, so many proteins in a cell, more than we can actually encode with DNA. We have a lot of DNA, but we don't have enough DNA for all of our proteins. And the way that's possible is splicing. Right? So when you make that perfect RNA copy, the mechanisms inside there are these little machines inside your cells called ribosomes. They say, I'm gonna take these parts, but not these parts. And they make different proteins from the same RNA strand. Now we use that knowledge. This is already happening from yeast all the way to people. This is already happening, but we use the scientific understanding of that to make a drug, a small molecule drug, that will actually change how this is done. So this is what it looks like, sort of. It's a picture of it. So your uh, nucleus is right here. This is the cytoplasm where all the action is happening. DNA makes RNA. And then it's processed right here. This is splicing into something usable. And then those little ribosome machines come along, and they read it bit by bit. They read a few, they pull an amino acid off and add it to a protein, pull another one, and eventually this protein chain is made and it folds up to do something useful. So when we're talking our analogies within the city, proteins are like a piece of plastic. You can fold this plastic into a binder to hold your paperwork from the conference, or you can fold it into a chair to sit on, right? It's the same basic underpinnings, but they, they do wildly different things. Might be the bumper of one of our cars. So once the protein is made, the RNA is degraded. Splicing that occurs right here allows us to restore or reduce a protein depending on what's wrong. So splicing modifiers can be used for a lot of different diseases, okay? Now let's talk about how this applies to Huntington's disease. In Huntington's disease, it's chromosome four that is affected. 
there is a CAG repeat that is too long in the Huntington gene, okay? Now, everybody has CAG repeats. It's only a problem once they become long enough to cause a problem, and that's around 40 or more. Um, so that's the genetic story of Huntington's disease. So the gene, we've already talked about this, but we're looking at it again. The gene DNA becomes RNA, RNA becomes spliced, and that is turned into a protein. So specifically with Huntington's, that protein has that repeat CAG length, and the ribosome didn't know to stop, right? So it gets longer and longer and longer, and it just folds and folds and folds, and it doesn't fit the right shape, right? Maybe a binder with some chair components. They're in the way, it doesn't work right. What this causes in the body, these proteins clump together, they see each other and they clump together. We call that aggregation and they kind of settle in the cells and they gum up the works. The cells aren't able to do what they want to do. How this affects the brain is as a response to that trauma, the brain over time shrinks a little bit as almost scarring, not exactly, but almost. And scientists believe that if we can make less of this mutant Huntington protein, the aggregation won't happen, the trauma in the brain won't happen, the shrinkage won't happen. This is the belief. So how does that actually happen? There's an exon that is inserted that, doesn't, that isn't naturally encoded in the DNA, but it's told to be inserted by the splicing the drug, okay? This exon has a stop sign on it. It tells the ribosome, don't, you're done. The protein is complete, when really it isn't. And it degrades because the body knows that this is a useless protein. It doesn't know that with the mutant Huntington protein, interestingly enough, right? That's, that's why there is a disease in the first place. The body didn't identify it as a protein that doesn't work right. But with this stop code on where it's placed, it stops the manufacture of the protein and the protein is recycled to go off and make more things. The RNA is also recycled to go off and make more RNA. Okay. Now in this slide, it says specifically down here, mutant Huntington protein. Obviously that's the therapeutic goal is you want to reduce the mutant Huntington protein. But I think it's important that I tell you that right now splicing mechanism technologies that the molecule cannot tell the difference between a health, healthy Huntington protein and a mutant Huntington protein. It lowers both equally. So that means that in a clinical design, it would be important to find the right amount of lowering that is effective and still safe, okay? And then finally, genes. How does this affect people's genes? Because all of the action of splicing modification is between RNA and proteins, it really doesn't affect genes at all. So a person who had a disease that was treated with a splicing modifier, if they got pregnant, they would have just exactly the same chance of passing that on to an unborn child as without the splicing mechanism. And right now, the technology is so new that you wouldn't want to try a pregnancy with a splicing modifier. We just don't know what that might do to an unborn baby. And that's everything I wanted to share with you today. Have you learned everything you wanted to know about splicing modifiers? Maybe a little bit more. I'm going to stop now and take any questions so we can complete your knowledge and answer any questions you might have had.